Hi everyone, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game, Elysium, designed by Matthew Dunstan and Brett J. Gilbert and published by Space Cowboys and Asmodee. As a demigod, you long to claim your place on Mount Olympus. But so do others. You're going to have to forge your own legends through great deeds and daring quests in order to prove yourself worthy and be heralded to the summit. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, start by randomly choosing one side of this template and placing it on the table. These are the quest tiles. The dots here indicate which ones to use based on the number of players. I'll be setting up a three player game, so I'll use the quests that show the three dots, returning these other ones to the box. Arrange them in ascending order from left to right underneath of the first template, and then put the epoch tracker beneath that, placing the marker on the one position. Sort all of the cards in the game into the eight different family decks as I have done here. These are distinguished by the unique colored border on the bottom portion, as well as the symbol in the top left hand corner. You will only play with five of the families, which you can choose randomly, but for your first game, choose these five and return the rest to the box. Then shuffle the chosen families together into a single face down deck. Now deal face up a number of cards equal to the number of players times three and then add one more. So in a three player game, that's three times three, which is nine and one more for 10. Place the remaining deck nearby and just note this area is known as the Agora. Now put out the level bonus tokens and the family bonus tokens that match the symbols of the family cards you included in your deck. Also create a common supply for the gold, victory points, and trigger rings. The player boards come in two parts that you assemble like this, and although I have them all together, each player should put their own board in front of themselves. Then randomly give one of the players the first turn order disc, and from them go clockwise around the table dealing in ascending order the remaining discs, returning any unused ones to the box. Each player should then take four gold from the supply and put it on their board and collect a number of victory points equal to the value shown on their turn order disc. And finally, they take one of each pillar color and place it on their board here. There are stickers included in the game that you can put on these pillars, which should assist any colorblind players. And that's the setup. Elysium is played over five rounds, also known as epochs. And during a round, you'll be able to collect cards from the Agora. And once you have them, they'll provide you with special abilities and powers that you can use. But they'll only be worth the victory points necessary to win once you convert them into a legend. But at that point, they typically lose their powers. So the challenge is determining which cards to acquire and how long to exploit their abilities before you convert them into those victory points you'll need to win. Each epoch is divided into four phases, starting with the awakening. You skip this in the first round, but normally this will involve removing all of the remaining cards in the Agora, placing them into a discard pile, and then dealing face out new cards until you again have a number face up equal to three times the number of players plus one, just like in the setup. Phase two of a round is called actions. The player with disc one will take a turn and then turns proceed in ascending order of discs. So it doesn't matter where you're seated at the table, it matters what turn order value you have. On a player's turn, they must either take one of the four quest tiles or a family card from the Agora. To collect a family card, you need to have pillars on your board that match the color cost, which is shown in the top right hand corner of the family card that you'd like to take. So if I want this one, I need to have a blue pillar. For this one, I'd need to have a green and red pillar. If the cost shows a black circle, that's wild. So for this one, I would need a red pillar and then a pillar of any other color. The area above your board is your domain and the area beneath is your Elysium. When you acquire a family card, put it into your domain. Instead of taking a family member on your turn, you can choose one of these four quest tiles. Their costs are shown directly above them. So if I wanted this, I would need to have a yellow pillar still on my player board. When you take a quest, it should be placed here. After acquiring a quest tile or a family member, choose and remove from your board 
one of the colored columns. Even if the color cost shows two different columns, I only have to choose and remove one. And the one I pick doesn't have to match either of the colors. I just have to remove any column I currently have. So for example, I could remove this yellow one. After you take your turn, the other players will take their turns, collecting family cards or tile quests. And I'm not gonna update these player boards with their actions, but they also will be removing columns from their board as well. Now when it comes back around to your turn, you have fewer columns to match up to items that you'd like to be able to collect. So you really have to be thinking ahead when you're choosing which columns to remove. Because now on this turn, I won't be able to take either of these two family members because they require the yellow column, and that's the one I got rid of. Perhaps instead, I'll collect this one, which requires a red column and then one of anything else, and maybe I'll remove this green column. Again, the other players will collect some items, and something else you can keep in mind is the columns that they have remaining because that might inform which items you choose to pick knowing what they'll be able to afford or not based on what they have remaining. This time around, maybe I'll collect this one and remove the blue column. When it comes to my final turn, I'll collect this quest tile, put it here and remove my column. Once all the players have used all of their columns, the round is over. There are a couple of important restrictions I would like to point out. In your domain, you can never have more than one copy of any card showing there at any one time. Also, during a round, you always have to collect one quest tile, but you can never have more than one. So what that really means is during a round, you're going to collect a quest tile and three family cards. Now, some of you might be rightfully wondering what happens during a round where you've been collecting items and removing columns, and suddenly it comes to your turn and you realize with the columns you have remaining, there isn't anything you can afford to pick up. Are you out of the round? Well, let me reset the table here very quickly and I'll show you what happens. Let's say I had already collected this family item and this quest tile and had these two columns remaining. Well, now I have a problem. Looking in the Agora, none of these have a cost that match the columns that I have. In that case, you then look at the available quests. And if you have a tile that matches one of those, collect it instead. However, I already have a quest and you can never have more than one, so even that option isn't available to me. In that case, you then draw the top card off the draw deck and put it face down in your domain. This is called a citizen. After you collect a citizen, then remove one of the columns as usual. Let's change things up though and say that I had not collected a quest earlier in the round and had only been collecting family cards. Well, now I only have one turn left and I haven't collected a quest yet and you always have to have at least one quest. But I can't afford either of these. In that case, you still get your turn and you may be able to use the effects on cards in your domain, but you will not be collecting a quest or family card. Then, once all of the other players have finished the round, any player who did not collect a quest takes any one of the remaining quests, but flip it face down and then put it beside your player board. All of the quests show the same thing on the back side, and that's why it doesn't matter which one you take. And this side is considered an incomplete quest. We'll see how that works and how citizens are used a little bit later. Before we move on to the next phase, let's talk about the value of having cards in your domain. First of all, they have special powers, and you'll be able to trigger and use these during your turn, but not during an opponent's turn. The symbols found here tell you when the powers can be activated, and these symbols represent what the powers are. If you forget what the power symbols represent, you'll find small text here, which will remind you. This symbol means that the power must be used the moment you take the card, and then it can't be triggered again. This is a one-use ability. And here it says you'll receive two victory points. So once you add that card to your domain, collect two victory points from the supply and add it to your board. This means that the power is always active so long as this card is in your domain. Any power that has a vertical dividing line means that when the player activates it, they will be targeted by this side of the effect and all other players will be targeted by this side. 
If a power shows this symbol, then it can only be used once per round, and after using that ability, you turn the card sideways as a reminder not to use it again until the next round. We'll see how these get refreshed a little bit later. This is a trigger power. When you first take a card with this ability, place a trigger ring on it. Then, when you use the ability, remove the token, and that effect cannot be used again. It's a one-use power, just like this one was. Except this triggers as soon as you take the card, and this one allows you to choose when the effect triggers. Some powers show an elusis symbol. In order to use this power, you need to have at least one other elusis card in your domain. If not, you can't trigger this ability. So if I had this one also in my domain, now both of them are able to trigger. The smaller symbol here shows us that in order to use this ability, you will also need to rotate it, so it's an effect that can occur once per round. There are some other power symbols, but those trigger during different phases of the game, so we'll look at these later. I believe that you'll be able to understand the effects of all of the cards based on the symbols and text that they provide, but should you have any questions, this guide is provided with the game that goes over every single card provided and explains in full detail all of their effects. The next phase is called Writing the Legends, which begins by reallocating the turn order discs. And of course, the players would have cards in their domains at this point, but I have removed them to help simplify this example. To start, the player with the lowest valued quest will collect the lowest valued turn order disc. Now, always be sure to ignore any incomplete quests at this point. So then, the next highest valued quest would gain the next highest valued turn order disc. Then, if you have a player with an incomplete quest, they simply take the highest remaining number. If you have multiple players with incomplete quests, then they should collect the remaining turn order discs based on their priority from the previous turn order. Now players will collect gold and sometimes victory points based on the symbols found here on their quest tile. So this player will collect two gold and two victory points. Following the new turn order, beginning with player number one, players will be able to transfer cards from their domain to their Elysium. You may transfer up to as many cards as shown on this value of your quest tile. So in this case, the player could only transfer one card to their Elysium. Each card you transfer then costs gold equal to its level, which is shown here and ranges from one to three. So if I was to transfer this one to my Elysium, it's gonna cost me one gold, which I will return to the supply. To be able to explain why you want to transfer cards to your Elysium, we're going to temporarily ignore these restrictions on what I can and can't transfer. So let's say I wanted to transfer this card as well. This will cost me two gold. Now, when you add a card to your Elysium, it can either begin its own legend, or you can join it to another legend that's already started. When you join it, you overlap the cards like this. There are two kinds of legends, either level or family ones. Family legends can only include cards from the same family, but they must all be different levels. This means I've started a family legend here, and if I transferred this card to my Elysium, I couldn't join it to this legend because it's not from the same family. I'd need to start a new legend. If I had had this card in my domain, then I could have added it to this family legend. At most, you can have three cards in a family legend, one from each level. A level legend has cards all sharing the same level, but from different families. So at most, you can have five different cards within a single level legend. For these next examples, I just want to point out that I have removed a couple of cards from these previously completed legends. When adding a new legend, I don't have to join this card to ones I already have started. For example, this would go perfectly here, but if I want, I can start a new legend. You can have any number of complete or incomplete legends going at the same time. With this legend, it could end up being a level legend or a family one. We don't know until a second card is added. And when creating a family legend, you don't have to add the levels in order. For example, I could now put this level three onto the legend and then later add the one to it. 
Citizens can also be transferred to your Elysium as long as they are being added to a legend that already has at least two cards in it. Citizens can take the place of any missing card in your legend, essentially acting as wilds, and their gold cost to transfer is equal to the level cost of the card they would be replacing. So the citizen could not be transferred to this legend because this legend is complete. But if it went here, it would be taking the place of the value three missing family card, and so it would cost me three gold. Whereas if I put it over into this legend, it would cost me two because it clearly is part of a level two legend. Once a card is added to a legend, either a brand new one or one that already exists, it cannot be moved to a different legend or discarded. If you would be transferring a card that has a trigger ring on it that hasn't been used, just discard the trigger ring before you do the transfer. This is essential because cards in your Elysium lose all of their abilities. Unless they show the Kronos symbol because these resolve at the end of the game and can provide you with some bonus points. Also note, if you have a card in your domain with this power symbol, its effect can be used once during this writing the legends phase. And your permanent powers remain active as well. Once the players have completed their transfers, the quest tiles will be returned to their original positions from left to right in ascending order. Now, as I mentioned, you can have several incomplete legends, but there are incentives for completing your legends early. When a player completes a family legend, they take the top bonus tile that matches that family. This is the Zeus symbol, so they would take this Zeus bonus tile, which will be worth an additional five victory points at the end of the game. The next player to complete a Zeus family legend will then take the two victory point bonus tile. Anyone else completing a Zeus legend will not gain an additional bonus. That said, it's even possible for the same player who already collected the first bonus to collect the second bonus if nobody else completes a Zeus legend before they complete their second one, earning them a total of seven victory points. The first player to write a level legend of at least two cards gets the matching bonus tile of that level. If another player continues a legend of the same level, but it contains more cards than the previous owner of the bonus tile, they then steal that and add it to their own collection. Each level bonus works this way, meaning that they can exchange hands multiple times during a game. However, once a player completes a level legend with five cards, no one can steal this token from them, as five is the most cards you can have in a level legend. The final phase is the end of the round, or as it's known, the end of the epoch. Each player should collect back their four differently colored columns, and also straighten any of the cards that they might have rotated for their effects. The marker should be moved one space to the right, and then the next epoch begins with the awakening phase. If this had been the end of the fifth round, then the game ends and players proceed to final scoring. During final scoring, each player should remove all cards in their domains and any legends in their Elysium comprised of only a single card. None of these will earn you any points. Now, any card in your Elysium with the Kronos symbol will trigger and activate its ability, oftentimes giving you bonus points. This is a scoring card. There are enough provided that each player can have one during the game, but now you're going to want to use it to calculate the values of your legends. Each family legend containing two cards is worth three points, and each family legend of three cards is worth six. So here's a three card family legend. I'll get six points for that. Whereas this one only has two cards, so it would give three points. Similarly, each of your level legends will earn you more points the more cards you have in them. For example, if you had two cards, you'd gain two points. But if you had a total of five cards, you'd get 12 points for that legend. Here we see three, and that means we would get four points. Don't forget, citizens can become part of legends as well. In this case, now we have four cards in the level legend and would gain eight points. But at the end of the game, you lose two victory points for each citizen you have in your Elysium. These victory points only come into play if you're using the Ares family in your game, and this is just a reminder to include your Kronos effect totals. 
Then players can pair their total victory points. And don't forget to include the tokens that you've collected on your player board as well. The player with the most points wins. If there's a tie, then the tied player with the most gold wins. If there's still a tie, then those tied players share the victory. There's just a couple of extra rules I'd like to go over now. As an example, I said that you cannot have two cards that are the same in your domain at the same time. That's true, but you can have them at different times. For example, once you transfer a card into your Elysium, then you could add that same card to your domain now, which means eventually you might have both of them in your Elysium, and that's fine. You just can't have them both in your domain at the same time. There's also a couple of changes to how a two-player game is set up. They're very minor, but let's take a quick look. When setting up a two-player game, you will have only these two quest tiles, which are unique and marked with the two dots here in the upper left-hand corner. And you position them between two column colors. And this means that if you want to pick up, for example, this quest tile, you would need to either have yellow or green. Not both, just either one of them. And the same here, you could have either blue or red to collect this one. Otherwise, a two-player game works exactly the same way. Remember, during this setup, you choose five of the available eight families to mix into the deck. If you happen to choose the Apollo family, which has this bottom green border, then during the setup, also put out the Oracle template. In addition to dealing cards to the Agora, you will also put four more cards face up right here. Now, during the awakening phase, starting in the second round, after removing all remaining cards from the Agora from the previous round, you slide any remaining cards up here in the Oracle area down into the Agora before dealing back up to three times the number of players plus one extra, as you would normally do. Then deal four new cards to the Oracle. In this way, players will get to see ahead of time some of the cards that may be present in the next round. And I say may be present because some of these Apollo cards will allow you to take cards directly from the Oracle area. If the Ares family is in your deck, then place all of the prestige points in a common reserve. Certain Ares family's abilities will allow you to collect these tokens, which would go here on your player board. During final scoring, the player with the most prestige will collect 16 points. The player with the next most will gain eight, and so on. If you have no prestige points, you're not eligible for any of the bonuses. If you're tied with another player for prestige, divide the cumulative total of the tied player's prestige points bonus. So let's say that two of the players were tied for second and third. You would add their eight and four points together to get 12 and then give each of them six. Then the next player with the most prestige would just get two points. And that's how you play Elysium. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.